A group of motorcyclists were racing through the wilderness when they unexpectedly stumbled upon a rusty old truck. Curious, they approached to take a closer look. Unaware of the danger that lies ahead, the truck belongs to none other than America's most terrifying creeper, recklessly. Red unzips his pants and starts marking his territory. Luke picks up a rock and hurls it at the truck's windshield with all his might. <laughs> oh! To his surprise, the seemingly fragile glass is incredibly tough, and the rebounding rock strikes him instead. Meanwhile, Kirk, after some fiddling, accidentally opens the truck's cargo door. What they find inside sends chills down their spines. The white bag's outline unmistakably reveals a human corpse. Cautiously, Kirk steps forward to confirm, and the stench of rotting flesh hits him like a ton of bricks. But as soon as he turns around, the truck's trap is triggered automatically, causing them to collapse in fright. The cargo door closes by itself, and realizing the peril, they take off running, they didn't even have time to put on their helmets, but causing trouble and then trying to run away? It's never that easy. Suddenly, a pipe shoots out from the truck's rear, a harpoon with a rope attached bursts out with tremendous speed striking Kirk in the calf with precision. Ah! Luckily, the remaining three are still righteous and didn't abandon Kirk to run away by themselves. However, as is typical in such desolate areas, there's no signal to call for help. They can only attempt to help themselves, but the harpoon is deeply embedded in Kirk's calf. Impossible to pull out. Things get worse when the rope suddenly starts retracting, slowly dragging Kirk back. The three friends are at a loss. The selfish Red chose to run away. The remaining two can only stand there helplessly, watching Kirk being pulled toward the truck's rear. Terrified, Kirk pleads with his friends to try calling for help again, but just as their companion takes out his phone, a sudden noise comes from above, followed by a corpse falling from the sky. Before they could react to what was going on, a tall humanoid monster landed on the roof of the truck waving its wings. It was the creeper, back from its hunt. The two friends, terrified by this sight, abandon Kirk and run for their lives. Instead, Creeper jumps to the ground unperturbed. It opens the rear compartment door of the truck with a tap, raises its right hand, and a javelin automatically flies into Creeper's hand. The Creeper aims at the fleeing pair. In an instant, the harpoon pierces through their bodies, pinning them to a tree like skewers. After a brief struggle, they go completely still, with his task complete. The creeper retrieves his weapon and is about to drive off to find his next target when he suddenly catches a whiff of something foul. It's Red's recent handiwork, which enrages the creeper, with his keen sense of smell. The creeper immediately locks onto the direction in which Red fled, daring to pee on its beloved truck. Red is now marked for death. Meanwhile, Red is desperately speeding away on his motorcycle. He finally saw a passing car and was about to ask for help when he was instantly captured by the pursuing creeper. Once the creeper sets his sights on prey, hardly anyone can escape. The creeper awakens every 23 years and goes on a 23-day feeding frenzy. Not only does it possess unnatural immortality, but it can also heal its injuries by consuming humans. The creeper's extraordinary sense of smell allows it to detect the scent of fear emanating from its prey and pursue them relentlessly, no matter where they hide. This brother and sister duo has the misfortune of becoming the creeper's targets. Naively believing they would be safe inside a police station, they soon learn the creeper can still snatch his prey in plain sight, though he didn't have time to drive away in his truck. Later, the police open the truck door and discover several corpses inside. This dilapidated truck is like a mobile slaughterhouse, filled with macabre human remains fashioned into grisly keepsakes. It sends shivers down their spines. A police officer sticks his head into the truck's cargo area to investigate, unaware that the truck's trap has already been triggered. <laughs> and his screams echo throughout the station. The mechanism inside the truck instantly severs one of the officer's arms. No one expected the dilapidated truck to be rigged with such sophisticated traps. They can't even move the bodies out of the truck, leaving Sheriff Davis furious and helpless. At this moment, several more police cars arrive slowly. It turns out the government has formed a special demon hunting squad to capture the creeper, leading the squad as their captain, Dan. Dan encountered the creeper during its last appearance 23 years ago which is why he was appointed to handle this case. But as the two were discussing the case, a few officers attempting to open the truck triggered another trap, nearly killing Dan. This close call leaves everyone shaken, having faced danger again. They no longer dare to tamper with the truck. After things calmed down, 
Davis took Dan aside and informed him that this time the creeper's rampage had resulted in the deaths of three officers and a prisoner, as well as the abduction of a civilian, but within minutes, a few officers come rushing over to report that the truck has already been towed away. Dan curses furiously because, based on his experience, he knows the creeper will definitely retrieve its beloved truck. This means the tow truck driver is in grave danger, just as they contact Deputy Dana and tow truck driver Frank over the radio, the creeper silently appears on the tow truck. With an axe in hand, the creeper severs the chains. By the time Frank stops the truck, the creeper's vehicle has already slid off the tow bed. Confused, Dana and Frank quickly get out to investigate, only to see the creeper standing on top of his truck, staring intently at them. To their surprise, the truck could drive itself. The creeper, having achieved its goal, flashed a smug smile and left choosing not to harm Dana and Frank. But just when Dana and Frank think they've escaped danger, they see the Creeper's truck returning. The Creeper has caught the scent of fear. His favorite prey is one engulfed in terror, and the terrified one is Frank. The truck stops not far away, but the Creeper is nowhere to be seen. Just as they look around, the Creeper suddenly descends from above, grabs Frank, and slams him to the ground. Dana quickly aims her gun at the Creeper, but the Creeper makes a dismissive gesture, Dana knows she's no match for the Creeper, and her handgun is useless against him. She can only watch helplessly as the Creeper takes Frank away. When Dan and Davis arrive in a hurry, they find a devastated and helpless Dana curled up in the driver's seat. Meanwhile, at dawn, a crow lands in front of a wooden cabin. A frail, elderly woman slowly steps out, staring ahead. Under the tree, a figure waves at her. Galen's expression is sorrowful, for the man is her deceased son, Kenny. It turns out that during the Creeper's last appearance 23 years ago, Kenny witnessed the Creeper abduct a man. Terrified, Kenny stepped out of the car to investigate, only to see a machete land on the hood. Next, a severed hand of the Creeper fell from the sky. Curious, Kenny took the still-moving hand home and hid it in the stable without telling his mother, but the horses, sensing the hand's evil aura, fled from the stable. For safety, Kenny buried the hand under the big tree in front of the house. Yet, in the end, Kenny couldn't escape the Creeper's hunt because he had touched the severed hand. Now, with the Creeper reappearing in town, it's likely it has come to retrieve its hand. The entire town would become the Creeper's hunting ground. Kenny's spirit tells his mother to take her granddaughter Addison and leave immediately, or they'll become the Creeper's next targets. This scene is witnessed by the newly awakened Addison, but she's no longer surprised. Since her father left, her grandmother has been acting this way. Addison's only companion is her prized horse. She wanted to ask her grandmother for money to buy hay for the horse, but they have no income and are in debt. Recalling her son's warning, Galen finds an excuse to send Addison to her friend's house for a few days. She plans to face the creeper alone, but Addison didn't listen to her grandmother. She was more worried about her horse running out of hay, so she went to the feed store, hoping to buy some hay on credit. However, since they already owed a lot of money, the owner refused her request this time. Left with no other choice, Addison decided to leave. The owner's son, Buddy, noticed Addison's predicament. Buddy, who had always secretly liked Addison, decided to help. Without his father's permission, he brought a few bales of hay to Addison's farm for free. Although Addison felt a bit embarrassed, she gladly accepted the hay to keep her horse from starving. She promised to repay Buddy when she had the money. Afterward, Addison accompanied Buddy to the neighboring plantation to deliver feed, where they stumbled upon a strange scene. Several horses, frightened, had run out of the paddock, and the farm workers were nowhere to be seen. When Buddy got out to investigate, he found the farm owner trembling under a car. Two workers were hiding beneath a nearby tanker. They seemed to have encountered something terrifying. The farm owner urged Buddy to call the police immediately. Seeing how nervous the owner was, Buddy didn't ask questions and prepared to call. Just as Buddy got back to the car and was about to make the call, a bloodied man suddenly appeared at the window, startling them. Before they could recover from the shock, another dark figure loomed overhead. It was the creeper, landing beside the tanker to attack the workers hiding underneath. Seeing the tanker being overturned by a tremendous force, they realized the creeper was behind them. The creeper noticed them and dropped the workers, seemingly more interested in the prey inside the car. When they looked up again, the creeper had vanished. Buddy tried to start the truck to leave, but it wouldn't start. Suddenly, the creeper appeared outside, eyes closed. Sniffing for the scent of fear, the creeper showed no interest in Buddy but focused on Addison sitting next to him. Yes, that's the scent. 
The creeper immediately flew over to Addison's side and used its hand to wipe away the blood on the car window. Its strange nose flared as it sniffed. After confirming that Addison was the prey it wanted, the creeper let out an excited roar, shattering the glass. Then, it smashed the truck window with a single punch, easily flipped the truck, and grabbed Addison. By the time Buddy realized what had happened, they were gone. The creeper didn't eat Addison right away after dragging her into the truck. Instead, it chose to continue hunting. This gave Addison a chance to survive. When Addison untied herself, she saw Kirk, the boy who had been injured by the truck's harpoon. Inside the cargo area, since they were from the same town, they recognized each other. They planned to escape before the creeper returned. Knowing there was a trap at the back, Kirk decided to exit through the front, but he didn't realize there was also a trap on the passenger side. As soon as Kirk touched the door handle, a steel pipe shot out, killing him instantly. Terrified, Addison stayed put, not daring to move. Meanwhile, at the farm, Kaylin was determined to find out what had happened to her son. Ignoring his spirit's warning, she dug up the severed hand. Kaylin carefully placed the hand on the table, noticing it was still moving. After a brief hesitation, Kaylin slowly reached out to touch the hand. The hand grabbed Kaylin's and lifted her into the air. Kaylin's eyes whitened and she fainted as her body convulsed violently. At the same time, Dan and Davis began gathering their team to hunt down the creeper. Team member Michael arrived with a modified pickup truck. Mounted on it was a 20mm Vulcan Gatling gun capable of firing 6,000 rounds per minute. Michael was confident this weapon could defeat the creeper. Just as the team finished assembling and prepared to search for the creeper, Kaylin, who had regained consciousness, called Dan and Davis over. When Kaylin touched the severed hand, she learned the creeper's secret, understanding what it was and how it came to be. But Kaylin refused to speak, and Dan and Davis didn't press her for answers. Determined to uncover the creeper's secret and find its weakness, Dan insisted on touching the severed hand himself. No matter how much Davis tried to dissuade him, it was no use. With the Galen's guidance, Dan slowly extended his right hand. The moment Dan was grabbed by the hand, he instantly lost consciousness. But with the team's help, Dan didn't lift into the air. Instead, he fell to the ground, convulsing, his eyes turning white. Shortly after, Dan awoke from his trance, visibly shaken by whatever he had seen. However, when Davis questioned him, Dan remained silent. Just then, Michael received an alert about an overturned car on Highway 9, suspected to be the work of the Creeper. Upon hearing this, Dan decided to launch a pincer attack, vowing to eliminate the Creeper this time. Michael headed out first, with Dan and Davis following closely behind. Soon, they spotted the Creeper's truck on Highway 9. Enraged, Davis took aim at the truck's tires with a sniper rifle and fired. To his surprise, the tires were bulletproof, and the shots ricocheted back. Davis then aimed at the truck's body, but the results were the same. The creeper retaliated by tossing a bomb, which Dan narrowly avoided by swerving the car. However, the bomb had a tracking system and returned the next second. Fortunately, Davis's precise aim allowed him to shoot and detonate it. At this moment, Michael arrived from the other side, ready to take down the creeper with his Vulcan Gatling gun. Seeing this, Dan felt a surge of dread and quickly radioed Michael, urging him not to fire. They knew the bullets would be ineffective and would rebound all attacks. But Michael didn't hear Dan's warning and the Gatling gun started firing. As expected, the bullets bounced back, killing Michael and the driver instantly. A bomb was then thrown, sending the pickup truck flying. Another bomb was hurled at Dan and Davis, and this time they couldn't dodge it, also getting blown into the air. Luckily, they only sustained minor injuries, but the creeper, driving its truck, followed them, stopping nearby and honking the horn maniacally to taunt them. Davis, holding his sniper rifle, stepped out of the car, ready for a final showdown with the creeper. Dan, who came up behind him, told Davis to stay calm and not let the creeper smell his fear or he would surely die. Seeing Michael's pickup truck nearby, Dan decided they should split up. He would go start the Gatling gun while Davis provided cover fire. When Davis turned around, Dan had already disappeared. The creeper, wielding an axe, was advancing step by step. Davis fired his rifle, but the creeper effortlessly blocked the shot with his axe. Davis stood and fired another shot, knocking off the creeper's hat. The creeper was enraged and, as Davis prepared to fire a third shot, it threw a dart. 
the dart precisely hit and damaged Davis's rifle barrel, leaving him with only his handgun for a final stand. As the creeper was about to strike Davis down, Dan finally reached the Gatling gun and called out to draw the creeper's attention, but the gun barrel was jammed. The creeper, now charging at Dan with his axe. <laughs> spread its wings and took to the air. In that instant, Dan felt his fate was sealed. In a critical moment, Dan used all his strength to unjam the Gatling gun and aimed at the flying creeper. Bullets rained down, riddling the creeper's body. To Dan's horror, even the 20 millimeters rounds had no effect, and the creeper pounced on him. From a distance, Davis watched as the creeper decapitated Dan with its axe leaving Davis no choice but to flee. As night fell, Galen knew the creeper was coming. She grabbed her shotgun, ready for a final battle. Outside, headlights appeared, and Galen thought it was the creeper. Kicking the door open, she found Buddy instead, who informed her that her granddaughter Addison had been taken by the creeper. Meanwhile, trapped in the truck's cargo area, Addison suddenly heard noises outside and quickly hid under a white sheet. Pretending to be dead, the injured creeper returned. It tore off the sheet and grabbed Addison, preparing to eat her to recover. As the creeper turned to grab a knife, Addison seized the moment to back away and hide. As the creeper pinned Addison down, she cleverly triggered the trap on the passenger seat, which impaled the creeper's head. The creeper let out a horrific howl, even losing an eyeball. Seizing the opportunity, Addison broke free, leaping to avoid the trap and jumping out of the truck. She got up and started running. Creeper tried to chase after her but fell to the ground. It turned out that Dan had used the Gatling gun to shoot off one of its wings. Getting up, the Creeper threw a dart, but Addison stumbled over a rock, causing the dart to miss her by inches. Enraged, the Creeper turned to grab a harpoon. With only one eye, it struggled to aim properly. As its prey got farther away, the Creeper hurled the harpoon with all its might. It missed, only catching Addison's jacket. She fell to the ground. The Creeper, wielding its axe, charged at her. Just as the creeper was about to grab Addison, an oncoming truck saved her life by ramming the creeper away. Addison got up and ran without looking back. For the first time, the creeper, who had killed so many, found itself in a pitiful state. It vented its fury on the truck driver, using the kill to heal its injuries. The creeper then drove to Addison's home to retrieve its severed hand. It found the hand on the ground, left by Galen along with a taunting message, I know what you are, enraged. The creeper crushed the hand into powder, letting out a beastly roar into the night sky. With its 23-day feeding window nearing its end, it had to abandon its current prey and go for a bigger target, before entering its 23-year hibernation. Meanwhile, Addison, who had narrowly escaped, was finally rescued by Buddy and her grandmother. Buddy got to embrace his crush, but just as they confirmed their relationship, they had to part the next morning. Buddy, a school basketball player, was heading off with the team for a game. Little did he know he would never return. The students on that school bus were the Creepers' next targets. 